Hello everyone, this is Rohan Shah with BestEconTutor.com and in this video we'll be looking at consumer and producer surplus. We'll be looking at consumer surplus, producer surplus, and efficiency. So, let's look at consumer surplus. Suppose we're given this marginal benefit schedule, which is really just the demand curve given to us in table format, and we're no, we know that the price is $5 for the good, and we're being asked, what is the consumer surplus? Well, let's first think about what the consumer surplus is. The word surplus comes from leftover surplus dollar amounts that the customer is willing to pay, but didn't have to. So, for example, if we were to look at the demand curve here, because again, this really is the demand curve, you know, the marginal benefit, another way to think about it is that it's the willingness to pay. It's how much, the most that you're willing to pay for that good. So for the very first item, you're willing to pay up to $10. This marginal benefit, it's measured in terms of dollars, so that's something to keep in mind. So you're willing to pay up to $10 for that first good. And because, you know, the subsequent items don't, sort of give you as much happiness as the ones before. For the second item alone, you're willing to pay eight, right? Not as much as the one before, but it's still giving you some happiness and so on. But notice, even though you're willing to pay a different amount for different slices of pizza, for example, you always end up paying the same amount at the, at the counter, right? Every good always costs the same amount. So in this case, the price is $5 for every good. So the very first item might have given you a $10 benefit, but you only have to pay $5 for it. So what that means is there was that the gap, that difference of $5 extra that you would have paid for the good, that's called your consumer surplus. So consumer surplus then is the extra amount you would have paid. So it's really the $10 that you, you were willing to pay minus the $5 that you paid for that first good. Now, let's say to that we're gonna, so you're gonna buy the first item would you buy the second item? Here's the thing, as long as your marginal benefit is greater than the price of the good, you'll buy it. If it was any less, you wouldn't buy it. Even if it was equal, if you're, some good give you a marginal benefit of exactly five, you'll still buy it anyways, you just get no consumer surplus out of it. So here, uh, your consumer surplus so far is that difference for that first item. Then for the second item, you're willing to pay eight, but you paid five, so eight minus five plus, so that's that. And then for the third item, you know, six minus five, because you're willing to pay $6 for the third item, but you only, again, had to pay five. So for each one, you're looking at the marginal benefit, but you're subtracting the price from each one. And then you add those all up. Notice that the fourth item, you're only getting a $4 benefit. So you wouldn't pay $5 for it. You technically get a negative $1 consumer surplus, which if somebody had a gun to your head and forced you to buy it, you would get a negative $1 consumer surplus. But in the free market, you don't have to buy it if you don't want to. So we would just assume then that this customer would stop buying at three, and so they don't have any negative consumer surplus for items there. So their overall consumer surplus would be um, $5 plus $3 plus $1. So in this case, that would be a $9 consumer surplus. Now, here's the thing. Here's your, how your book's probably going to have it. For something like this, we're assuming that you can't really buy a fraction of a good, so you can't really buy 1.3 of this item. So really, your demand curve, your marginal benefits, just they're assuming a $10 for the first good, you know, $8 for the second good, so they make a, a horizontal line like this, and then $6 for the next one, and so on. So, so in that case, your consumer surplus, you know, if you have to pay, so your demand curve is kind of like a step function. This is your demand curve, and so. If you had to pay five dollars, then this area is technically your consumer surplus. Now, usually, what we end up doing is we sort of end up having, you know, a more straight demand curve, and so that's why, as we'll see in a sec, the consumer surplus. One way to estimate it, if this is a price, is that it's simply that area. Now, let's look at producer surplus. Just like consumer surplus, it's kind of the leftover 
uh, but it's for the dollar amount, it's a leftover dollar amount, but it's for the producer. Here's actually a better way for you guys to think about producer surplus. It's kind of like the same thing as profit for now. As we'll see later in the course, there's just a small difference between producer surplus and profit, uh, and the only difference is fixed costs. But for now, it's really kind of like very similar. They function the same way. And so one way to think about the producer surplus, well, let's see here. If you're selling this good for $5 each and it's costing you uh, $1 to make the very first item, well, how much of a profit will you make from selling it? If you're selling it for five and it only costs you a dollar to make it, well, that's five minus one, right? $4 profit from that one. Plus, with the second item, you cost you three to produce it, you can sell it for five, so that's five minus the three dollars it costs you to make it. Plus, the very third item, it cost you five to make it, you could sell it for five, so yeah, you can make it anyways and get no producer surplus out of it, but then, you wouldn't want to sell the fourth item, right? You'd want to stop there because the fourth item would cost you seven to make. So if you went ahead and made that anyways, you'd only be able to sell it for five, so you'd lose two dollars. It would take two dollars away from your total profit. So you wouldn't do that. If you're maximizing profit, which any rational person would, uh, then you would stop producing at three. So if you're a producer in this market, and if we want to find your producer surplus, assuming you're being rational, you'd stop producing at three, and your producer surplus, meaning kind of like profit, would be $4 for this first item, uh, $2 for the second item, and $0 profit made from that third item, but overall your producer surplus is $6. So that is how you find producer surplus. Now, of course, uh, you could plot this anyways, and that would be the supply curve, right? Because the marginal cost curve is a supply curve. So if you were to have the different costs for the first item, second item, third item, and it costs you $5 to make it, then that difference over there, adding all those up, that is the producer surplus also. Now, as I said, the consumer surplus then can also be thought of as uh, the this area underneath the demand curve or the marginal benefit curve and above the price that you pay. So if the price is $5, this area is then a good estimation of the consumer surplus. So what if the price in the world dropped from $5 to $4? As a consumer, you kind of have more surplus now, right? Because you have to pay even less. So your producer, your consumer surplus increases uh, there because you're only paying, so it's that plus it goes up by this much. And also for four, you're going to buy more items than before. So it's kind of going up for two different reasons because you're buying more items. Overall, this, uh, this trapezoid is what it's going to increase by. So you're going to buy more items and you're sort of paying less per item. So your CS goes up by that trapezoid when your price goes down. So now if we were to look at a demand and supply graph in a free market, and this is the equilibrium price and quantity, well then this area would be the producer surplus. And this area would be the consumer surplus. Now, here's how we define total economic surplus. It's the sum of these two for now. So what that means is efficiency is when the total surplus is as high as possible. So we want their total to be as high as possible if we're being efficient. Now here's the thing. We definitely need a government to set up the free market and make sure all of our assumptions are met and whatnot, as we talked about in the first module. But Sometimes government intervention can actually make a market more inefficient. As we'll see in, in the next module, if we were to get the government involved and if they were to have a price ceiling or a price floor or something, and either way, if they were to make the market not at equilibrium, uh, we might have a case where the total surplus CS and PS only add up to something less than what they add up to now, and we would have you know, a certain area that we're not able to get into either the consumer or producer surplus, and that would be deadweight loss. So deadweight loss is how inefficient we are or how lower our total consumer and producer surplus is compared to what it could be. Now, here's the thing though, just because a market's efficient doesn't actually mean it's good. So the word efficient is not interchangeable with good because there's always this trade-off in economics between being efficient, meaning having a higher total, 
or equal, equity, equity versus efficiency. If I were to just tell you that, hey, you know, one market's efficient and the other's not, which market's, you know, better for you, you actually don't know because what if you had one market where the consumer surplus was $50 and the producer surplus was also $50 versus another market where the consumer surplus was zero but the producer surplus was $200. Well, if you're a consumer, you'd probably want to be in this market, even though it's inefficient because the total CS and PS only add up to 100 versus here, they add up to 200. So looking at efficiency alone isn't the end-all be-all measure of, oh, this is where we definitely should be, this is good, but it is one measure that we take into account. You also have to take equity into account, but more on that later. So here we have some questions from students. The first one. How exactly is producer surplus almost the same thing as profits? Good question. Here's the thing. Profits, the way we define them, are revenues minus total costs. Now, if you think about it, what we're doing with producer surplus is we're doing the price that you charge from your customer minus the marginal cost, and we're adding that up for all the different units. So that's kind of how it's very similar to profit. It's what you're charging from your customer, your revenue, minus your marginal cost, if you add all that up, that's kind of like your profit. The only difference is for profit, we would do that same thing, but we'd also subtract the fixed costs. Like if, you, if your business has a rent or something for the office space, then that's also subtracted when calculating your final profits. So an equation you'll see later in the course is that profits really are your producer surplus minus the fixed cost. Another question we have here is, how exactly are consumer and producer surplus uh, represented with areas? All right, good question. So we talked about how consumer and producer surplus, you can kind of calculate them by looking one individual at a time. Now, what if you have a supply and demand graph where your quantities are in the thousands, right? Like let's say this quantity was a thousand units. Technically, you'd have to add up every single individual consumer and producer surplus. So you'd actually have to make a thousand numbers and add them all up. So usually for something like this, uh, this is more so something from calculus, so we don't need to get into it, but an estimation of that sum is the area using an integral. So we definitely don't need to get into that, but just know the end result is that you can use this area then as an approximation for what, what those thousand individual numbers would have added up to. So this area is your consumer surplus. And similarly, this area is your producer surplus. So you can always use that if that's the easier thing to use. But if you're given the exact numbers, you might as well calculate it exactly. Well, I hope you now understand economics better. And if you really want to make sure you've mastered the concept, check out our active learning customized platform at bestecontutor.com. It's like having a one-on-one -on -one tutor right in front of you 24-7. You can click here to try it out for free. And we'll be adding more topics and videos on YouTube, so make sure you subscribe below for the latest updates.